And this is basically a stable diffusion tutorial for people who have just downloaded stable diffusion and who have no idea what they are looking at. To begin, this is the prompt box and this is where you will type in the prompts for the images you want to generate. So for example, if I type in the following prompt and click generate, as you can see, stable diffusion has generated the image and I can click generate again and stable diffusion will create another image and again, and I could keep doing this for as many times as I would like and a new image will be generated each time. Now, one of the cool things about Stable Diffusion is that you can create art in the style of other artists as well. So for example, if I type in by Pablo Picasso and then click generate, an image will be generated in the style of Pablo Picasso. And this doesn't just apply to artists themselves. You can actually change the style of the art as well. So if I want graffiti art instead, I could click generate. And as you can see, graffiti art has been generated. One of the main things that you have to know about stable diffusion is this button here. And what this button does is reuse the seed from the last generation. Now, what that means is that up to now, every time we click generate, a new image has been generated. But now by clicking reuse seed from that last generation, the seed is effectively locked in. So now that every time I click generate, the image itself won't change so long as I don't change any other parameters as well. So, this is useful because now we can modify the other parameters of an image and see how they affect the actual end image. So if I type in the following prompt and click generate, I can now lock in this image by using this button here. And now I can demonstrate what negative prompts are. Now negative prompts if prompts are everything you want in your image, negative prompts are everything that you do not want in your image. So for example, if I now type in the word white to remove the actual white paint that is on the car and click generate. As you can see, the image has changed and removed the white from the image. Now, this doesn't only just apply to colors, you can also use it for other attributes of the image. So let's say, for example, I don't, I have a picture of a person smiling and I want a picture of a person who's not smiling. I could type in smiling into the negative prompt box and then click generate. And then, then the image will be generated of a person who is not smiling. So that's a basic intro to negative prompts. So moving on, here we have sampling prompts, sampling steps. And what sampling steps are, Think of it as the amount of effort that would be put into the generation. So to demonstrate this, I will use the following prompt. And I will turn the sampling steps down and click generate. And here we have the final image. Now pay attention as by increasing the sampling steps, we'll be able to create an even more higher quality image. So to do this, I will increase, lock in the seed and then click generate. Now, if you see the difference between the two images, there is more detail in the image that had the higher sampling steps. And this is what I mean by how sampling steps effectively increase the quality of your image. So this was with eight and this image was with 16. Now I can keep doing this. I can increase the sampling steps again and then click generate. And now we have even more detail within our image. So this was with eight, 16 and now 23. Now the important thing of sampling steps to remember is that Yes, if you do increase your sampling steps, you will get a higher quality image. 
but it will take more time for the actual image to generate. Now, this is important, especially if you have a weaker GPU, because this could be this could mean that you're waiting a long time for your image to be generated. So now moving on to the next parameter, we have batch count and batch size. Now what batch count and batch size are is they will determine how many images are generated at once. So for example, if I put up the batch count to three and then click generate, Stable Diffusion will now generate three images instead of one like we have been doing up till now. So we, here we have the three images, one, two, three. And we could also do this with batch size as well. So if I set it to three and then click generate, as you can see, three images have been generated. One, two, and three. Now, the imp one of the main differences between batch, the batch count and batch size, although the functions are similar. There is a there is a difference between them too. The difference is batch count generates images sequentially, so one after the other. So it will generate the first image, then the second image, then the third image. Batch size, on the other hand, will generate images in parallel, so it will generate all the images at once. Theoretically, this does mean that batch size, if your PC is capable enough, will be able to generate images faster just because it's generating it all at once. However, in my testing, I have not seen a, a noticeable difference between using batch count and batch size. So that's just something to keep in mind. Moving on, we have width and height. And while these two are self-explanatory, there is something to keep in mind when using them. And that is, even if you do modify the width and height slightly, you can you have the chance of generating an entirely different image. So this is an image I've generated using 512 by 512. Now, if I bump up the width slightly and then click generate, as you can see, the image itself has changed dramatically. So this was with the increased width and this was the original image. So that's just something to keep in mind whenever you're messing around with the width and height. The next thing I want to show you is CFG scale. Now think of CFG scale as creativity on one side and following the prompt on the other. So by setting the CFG scale to the lowest value, I'm essentially telling Stable Diffusion to generate, to be as creative as possible, even if it means ignoring the prompt. So if I do that right now and click generate, as you can see, Stable Diffusion has completely ignored the prompt and I can't really see the city landscape here. Whereas if I bring it up to the other extreme end, I'm basically telling Stable Diffusion to follow the prompt no matter what. So if I click Generate, it has done its best to follow the prompt. However, you'll notice now that by using it, by setting the CFG scale really high, you will introduce artifacts in your image. And what, and so, as you can see from this image here, the colors are very washed out and it doesn't really look natural. So that's something to keep in mind. And so what I'm trying to say here is that you never really want to set your CFG scale to any any of the extreme values. So neither, neither extremely high or extremely low. What you want to do ideally is keep it somewhere between seven and slightly increase it or slightly decrease it depending on your needs. So if you want it to be slightly more creative, you would reduce it slightly. And if you want it to follow the prompt more, you will increase it slightly. Now, the next thing I want to show you is restore faces. So to, to show this, I will use the prompt selfie of a man and use the following seed and click generate. And as you can see, it's generated an image of a man. Now, Notice how the eyes look a bit unnatural. To fix this, we can use restore faces. So by clicking restore faces and then clicking generate, 
as you can see, the eyes have been fixed and look much more natural. So comparing the two images, this was without restore faces and this was with restore faces. You can see by selecting restore faces, the image, the actual face is modified slightly to make it look much more natural. So that is a useful option, especially if you're generating a lot of images of human faces. Now, the next option I would like to show you is tiling and tiling is useful if you want to create seamless repeating patterns. So this is very useful if you are, for example, a game developer who wants to create game textures. So by using tiling, I can create repeating patterns and so on. The next thing I would like to show you is high res fix. Now, what is high res fix? Why high res fix exists is because stable diffusion was trained on image sizes like 512 by 512. So if I now use a much higher width and height that stable diffusion is, has not really been trained on, it can still work, but there is a chance that you will introduce artifacts in the images. So there is a chance like if you're generating a picture of a human and use a non-standard resolution, you could end up with a double head or double face, double hands, and other weird sort of artifacts in the image. So the solution to this, if you don't want these weird things in your image, is to use high res fix. Now, what we do with high res fix is generate the image in a standard size that stable diffusion has been trained on. So for example, 512 by 512. And then to upscale it, use high res fix to upscale your image. So if I do that, I can see it can take slightly longer when you, when you are using high res fix. And here we go. Here we have our image now upscaled to 512 by upscaled to the newer resolution. Upscaling images is a complicated topic in itself, but the general gist is that if you are creating images, you should that you want in higher resolution. First, create the images in a standard resolution like 512 by 512, then use high res fix to upscale your image. And that is the basic basics of it. Now, Moving on, we have sampling methods. Now think of sampling methods as sort of how they affect the way your image is generated. So for example, if I generate an image, this is with Eula A. Now, if I change the sampling method, so that is a different one and keep the sampling C the same and now click generate. you can see the image ha itself has changed. So this was with Eula A and this was with the other. The images you can see from the image has changed. And that's what sampling methods do. And finding the sampling method that works for you is basically a case of trial and error. Some sampling methods are better at lower sampling steps. So for example, if you have a weaker PC, some sampling methods can, are able to work with much lower sampling steps and still produce higher quality images. While other sampling methods are better for certain art types. So for example, certain sampling methods may be able to produce better looking or more realistic looking images than others. And so finding out which one is suited for your type of task is really a case of trial and error. And I suggest just looking online and comparing different images used by, made by different sampling methods and picking the one you like the most. Now that is a, a basic, a very brief introduction to stable diffusion. But one more thing, if you are stuck with trying to generate prompts, there is a website that will show you a very good prompts to use. So the website's called Prompt Hero. And if you search by stable diffusion model, as you can see, it has a wide range of images that you can choose. And when you select an image, it will show you the prompt that was used. So now I can copy this prompt and copy its seed value, its CFG scale, its sampling steps, 
and its width and height, and then click generate. And as you can see, Stable Diffusion has created the image that looks very similar to the one we've seen. And there is a slight difference, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe he's used a different Stable Diffusion model or version that we, ha that we have used, or he's used a different sampling method. But as you can see, the image is, the, both the images are very similar in the way they look. So that is just a useful website, just in case you are struggling with prompts to use. And that is it, and I'll see you in the next video.